the woman known to history as Empress Maria Theresa, was born on the 13th of May 1717 in the Hofburg Palace in the center of the city of Vienna as Maria Theresa Valberga Amalia Christina. Her father was Emperor Charles VI, ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, Archduke of Austria, King of Hungary and Bohemia, and head of the House of Habsburg. As such, Charles was one of the most powerful rulers in early 18th century Europe. Maria Theresa's mother was Elisabeth Christina of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, a daughter of the Duke of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, one of the most powerful German lords of the day. She had married Charles in 1708, and three years later, he succeeded his brother, Joseph I, as head of the House of Habsburg and the Holy Roman Emperor. At that time, Charles and Elizabeth still did not have any children, perhaps partly owing to Charles's homosexuality. However, his accession as emperor in 1711 placed an onus on the pair to produce an heir. A son, Leopold, was born in 1716, but the child was ill from birth and died just over six months later. Thus, when Maria Theresa was born the following May, she was her parents' only surviving child. Another daughter, Maria Anna, would follow in September 1718. A third daughter, Maria Amalia, was born in 1724, but she died in 1730. No further sons were born, a fact which would have a significant bearing on Maria Theresa's life. Maria Theresa's childhood was typical of a princess during the 18th century, a period of lavish court ceremonial and pageantry. As such, much of her education centered on learning to dance, sing, play music, and engage in the other pursuits which were the preserve of the Austrian court as well as other European courts. In a profoundly Catholic country, it was perhaps unsurprising that her tutors were members of the Society of Jesus or Jesuits. It was from these tutors that she learned the core subjects of the humanist educational curriculum which had been disseminated around Europe during the Renaissance. Latin, rhetoric, grammar, poetry, history, and moral philosophy. However, that was supplemented by new subjects addressing the emerging sciences following the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Much of her time would have been spent away from her family, as was typical of the courts of the time, and spent instead with her own household staff. Additionally, her relationship with her father was poor, in large part owing to the fact that Charles had yearned for a son as an heir and as a replacement for the deceased Leopold, and he was devastated when a daughter was born in 1717. Nevertheless, Maria Theresa was his heir, and in 1731, when she was 14 years old and deemed to be entering her adult years by the standards of the time, her father began allowing her to sit in on meetings of the government council, though he never consulted her on policy matters. The nation which Maria Theresa was destined to one day rule over had emerged as one of Europe's great powers in the strangest of ways. It was based entirely around the House of Habsburg, the family which carved out Austria as its own fiefdom. The family was descended from a relatively minor lord of the Alpine region who had built a fortress in Switzerland in the 11th century, which was known as the Habsburg Castle. Later, the family adopted this name. They gradually expanded their land holdings into Austria in the High Middle Ages, and from 1452 down to the mid-18th century, every Holy Roman Emperor hailed from the House of Habsburg. This, combined with a shrewd series of marriage alliances, saw the territory which the Habsburgs ruled directly expand to cover most of modern-day Austria. The titles of Duke and then Archduke of Austria followed. Later, Ferdinand of Habsburg succeeded as King of Hungary and Bohemia. Further territorial acquisitions in what is now Belgium and Northern Italy ensured that by the time of Maria Theresa's birth, the Austrians controlled the territory approximating to modern-day Austria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Croatia and much of Slovakia, as well as the Duchy of Milan and the kingdoms of Sardinia and Naples in Italy. The Habsburgs ruled Austria as absolute monarchs in line with the absolutist principles which had emerged in countries like France, Russia, Austria and Prussia in the 17th century. 
This approach was the opposite of that of countries like Britain and the Dutch Republic, where parliamentary bodies were becoming more powerful. By way of contrast, in Austria the state was governed by the head of the House of Habsburg as Holy Roman Emperor, Archduke of Austria, and King of Hungary and Bohemia. The ruler, in this case Maria Theresa's father, Charles VI, appointed a narrow collection of all-powerful ministers who managed the government on his behalf. Austria was also one of the most monolithically Roman Catholic states in Europe, although it did have a number of important religious minorities, notably a substantial Jewish population, many Protestants in Bohemia and Hungary, and both Eastern Orthodox Christians and some Muslims in the Balkan territories. The economy of Austria was underdeveloped by comparison with countries like England, the Dutch Republic and Sweden, being primarily based on agriculture, while it was also well behind its Western European rivals in terms of its education system. Furthermore, its military was no rival for its northern neighbour, Prussia, whose military was the most effective in Europe, and whose king, Frederick William I, had transformed the nation into a major rival of Austria's in Central Europe. This was the realm which Maria Theresa would rule one day. Her father had made plans to ensure this even before she was born. When he had become Archduke and Holy Roman Emperor in 1711, Charles was the last male heir in the direct line of the House of Habsburg. Austria at the time followed the Salic Law, which prohibited women from succeeding to the throne. But in order to widen the base of possible heirs and ensure that the Habsburgs' territories did not pass to another European royal family when he died, Charles had what is known as the Pragmatic Sanction passed in 1713. This stipulated that all of the territories which he ruled in Central Europe, the Low Countries and Italy, could pass undivided to a female heir, thus increasing the possibility that the Habsburg line would not die out. It was a fortuitous decision, for when he died many years later, Charles would only leave behind female heirs, of whom Maria Theresa was the oldest. However, as we will see, the pragmatic sanction was not accepted unequivocally by others who had a claim to the Habsburg territories when the day came for Maria Theresa to succeed her father. Already in the mid-1720s, extensive consideration had been given in Vienna to Maria Theresa's potential husband. One possible contender was Leopold Clément, heir to the Duchy of Lorraine in eastern France, and a scion of the French royal house of Bourbon. However, his premature death from smallpox in the summer of 1723 ended speculation on this front. Another suitor was Prince Frederick of Prussia, the heir to King Frederick William I, who was just a few years older than Maria Theresa. A marriage alliance with the Prussians was viewed as favourable at the Austrian court as it would potentially neutralise Prussia as a threat to Austria in Central Europe. But Prussia was a solidly Protestant state and the match was ultimately unacceptable to the Roman Catholic establishment in Vienna. As a result, Charles betrothed his daughter and heir to Prince Charles of Spain, a younger son of Philip V, the King of Spain from 1724 onwards. The match, which carried the possibility of Austria and Spain being ruled by a husband and wife, a scenario which would have hugely disturbed the balance of power amongst Europe's great states, was unacceptable to countries like Britain and France, and under pressure from these nations, Charles VI abandoned the arrangement in the late 1720s. In the event, the other powers were correct to be concerned, as Prince Charles of Spain did eventually become King of Spain in 1759, following the death of his childless brother, Ferdinand VI. In response to these developments, Charles increasingly looked towards Francis Stephen, the younger brother of the deceased Leopold Clément of Lorraine, as a potential husband for Maria Theresa. The House of Lorraine was particularly favoured by the Austrian nobility for their ultra-Catholic credentials and Francis Stephen had been brought to the Austrian court in Vienna all the way back in 1723 in order to observe him as a possible marriage partner. Other suitors came and went in the 1720s, but when the possibility of marrying Prince Charles of Spain fell through in the late 1720s, Francis Stephen was increasingly viewed as Maria's likely husband. 
he became a more attractive prospect owing to the fact that he was potentially going to succeed the childless Grand Duke of Tuscany in Italy, Gian Gastone de' Medici. This would potentially make Maria Theresa Duchess of Tuscany one day, further cementing Austria's control over the Italian peninsula. By the mid-1730s, it was clear that Maria would marry Francis, and they were finally officially betrothed in January 1736. They married just two weeks later. It would be a tempestuous relationship in which Maria Theresa was possessive of her husband, but he never betrayed any sense that he had married her for any reason other than the political ambitions of himself and his family. While Maria Theresa's marriage to Francis Stephen was being negotiated and then agreed in the 1730s, Austria was involved in two wars which had a significant bearing on Maria's future reign. The War of the Polish Succession was fought between 1733 and 1735. It was sparked by a civil war over the succession to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth following the death of King Augustus II in 1733. Most of Europe's major powers became involved in order to further their own ambitions. Austria supported the claim of Augustus's son, Augustus III, who eventually became king. The fighting ended in 1735, but full peace terms were not agreed until the signing of the Treaty of Vienna in 1738. Through this, Austria's preferred candidate for the throne of Poland, Augustus III, was recognized as the ruler of the Commonwealth by the other European powers. But in return, Austria was forced to cede the Kingdom of Naples in Italy to Spain, while Maria's new husband, Francis, also had to renounce his claim to the Duchy of Lorraine in France. Thus, Austria gained influence to the east in Poland, but lost influence to the west in eastern France and southern Italy. More broadly, the war confirmed both the weakness of Poland, as well as how its politics were now determined by its neighbours, paving the way for the gradual carving up of its territory and division amongst its neighbours many years later. Another conflict which had broken out in 1735, just as the active fighting in the War of the Polish Succession was coming to an end, was the Russo-Turkish War. Between the 15th and 17th centuries, the Ottoman Empire had been the pre-eminent power in the Balkans, expanding aggressively and even placing Vienna under a major siege in 1683, which under other circumstances might have resulted in the conquest of the city. Yet by the 18th century, the Ottomans were entering a period of steep decline as they failed to keep pace with the technological and military advancements underway amongst Europe's Christian powers. As this occurred, Austria and Russia the Ottomans' two northern neighbours in the Balkans and the Black Sea, engaged in a series of wars to wrest control of territory from the Turks. The conflict, which erupted between Russia and the Ottomans in 1735, was one such war of adventure. Russia overran the Ottomans' possessions in the Crimea within a few months, following which Charles VI decided to enter the war on Russia's side against the Turks. However, his armies lost a series of engagements in the Balkans in 1737 and 1738, highlighting the weaknesses of the Austrian military, and when the Treaty of Belgrade was signed in 1739, it did not result in territorial gains for Austria. However, the war set the template for Russia and Austria to begin dismantling the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans and the Black Sea a process which would continue throughout Maria Theresa's long reign and well into the 19th century. The Treaty of Belgrade was one of the last major acts of the reign of Maria Theresa's father. Charles VI died on the 20th of October 1740, most likely from having consumed poisonous mushrooms while on a hunting trip in Hungary. Upon his death, Maria succeeded in line with the pragmatic sanction to become the first female ruler of the House of Habsburg, Archduchess of Austria, Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, and shortly afterwards the first Empress of the Holy Roman Empire. Her accession was formally recognized five weeks later when the Austrian estates paid homage to her in Vienna on the 22nd of November. The previous day, she had appointed Francis as co-ruler to assuage doubts about Austria having a female ruler and he would co-rule with her as Francis I of Austria, although Maria would wield greater authority during their reign. 
However, there was no time to enjoy her accession. Her father had been a poor ruler who had left the Austrian treasury deeply mired in debt. As a result, the Austrian military, which had been weakened as a result of the Polish and Turkish wars of the 1730s, was unpaid and thousands of men had begun to desert. However, Charles had failed to train his daughter in matters of statecraft and she had no experience of ruling when she ascended, a problem which was compounded by the incompetence of several of Austria's leading government ministers at the time. These problems were further added to within weeks when several of the European powers made it clear that they would not accept Maria Theresa's accession, calling into question the legal validity of the pragmatic sanction which Charles had passed in 1713, allowing a daughter of his to succeed to all of his territories. In particular, Charles of Bavaria, the ruler of the Electorate of Bavaria as Prince Elector and head of one of the most powerful German states, had a claim to the Habsburg territories if the validity of the pragmatic sanction was to be questioned. He also appealed to the scores of other German states and free cities to refuse to accept a female ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. As with so many other European conflicts of the 18th century, a number of other powers soon joined in the conflict to further their own dynastic and territorial ambitions. As a result, within weeks of Maria's accession, the War of the Austrian Succession had erupted, pitting Austria, Britain, the Dutch Republic and Hanover against Bavaria, France and Prussia. It would last for eight years and, in due course, Spain and Sweden allied with Bavaria, while Russia joined the war on Austria's side. The war had an international dimension for powers like France, Britain, Spain and the Dutch Republic, which each had extensive overseas colonies. But for Maria Theresa and her government, the fighting was largely confined to Central Europe. Her forces were on the back foot from the beginning. Frederick II, who had succeeded his father as King of Prussia in May 1740, had been preparing for the inevitable succession of Maria and he invaded Austria in mid-December 1740. The Prussian army was the greatest fighting force in Europe in the 18th century and it easily overran much of Austria's northern territories in the final weeks of 1740. In particular, Frederick was able to occupy the province of Silesia. This was a long contested region which straddled the borders between Prussia, Austria and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It is rich in minerals and Frederick wanted possession of its valuable mines. Thus, his quick occupation of Silesia in the winter of 1740 was a major victory to begin with and he would secure the province at the end of the war. This was probably the foremost result of the conflict for Austria and Prussia as it tilted the economic equilibrium within Germany in favor of the Prussians going forward. The wider war lasted until 1748, though the bulk of the fighting was over by 1745, after which time the main antagonists entered into peace negotiations at the city of Aachen near Cologne in western Germany. The resulting Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle was primarily negotiated for Austria by Britain and Maria Theresa severely resented her virtual exclusion from the peace talks. Some of the terms were favorable to her nonetheless. For instance, all sides agreed to accept the legal validity of the pragmatic sanction and so recognized Maria as the rightful ruler of all the Habsburg territories and as Holy Roman Empress the male title of which had briefly been held by Charles of Bavaria during the war, ending three centuries of uninterrupted Habsburg holding of that title. However, in return for her formal recognition as Empress, Archduchess of Austria and Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, Maria had to cede Silesia officially to Prussia, while also relinquishing some of her territories in Italy to Spain and recognizing the independence of the duchies of Modena and Genoa there. The other terms primarily concerned Britain and France and their overseas colonies. As such, Maria had gained formal recognition of her right to rule from Europe's powers, but at the loss of Austrian influence in Italy and the province of Silesia, the latter of which was a particularly bitter pill to swallow and which Maria would obsess over recovering for the remainder of her reign. Maria's determination to oversee the war effort from Vienna in the 1740s was complicated by her almost continuous pregnancies. 
Within weeks of marrying Francis in 1736, she was already pregnant, and she remained so for most of the next 20 years, eventually giving birth to 16 children between 1737 and 1756, 11 girls and 5 boys. One of her daughters died during birth, while both of her first two daughters, Maria Elizabeth and Maria Carolina, born in 1737 and 1740, died in infancy. Of the other 13 children, several more would die before reaching their adult years. Charles Joseph, Maria Johanna, and Maria Josepha, all being carried away by a smallpox wave which devastated Austria in the 1760s. Consequently, only 10 of her 16 children survived into their adult years, but they would generally lead long lives by the standards of the time. A male heir arrived in the spring of 1741, in the shape of Archduke Josef, while three more sons, Leopold, Ferdinand, and Maximilian Franz, would all outlive their mother, and Maria was assured that there would be no further succession crises pursuant from her own passing. As we will see later, a number of her daughters would also play important roles in the dynastic politics of Europe during the second half of the 18th century. Despite their growing brood of children, Maria Theresa's marriage to Emperor Francis was never a happy union. Although Maria was initially determined to forge a close and happy union with her husband, he never warmed to his Austrian wife and became a serial adulterer as the years went by. Some of this was open knowledge at court, which must have caused considerable distress for Maria. For instance, when the Countess Maria Wilhelmina von Nieperg arrived to the Austrian court in Vienna in the mid-1750s as a 17-year-old maid of honor to the Empress, Francis quickly began an affair with her, despite being 30 years older than her. This particular infidelity lasted for several years, and Francis was indiscreet enough that foreign dignitaries to the court of Vienna wrote about it when reporting to their governments back in London, Paris and Madrid. These issues aside, Francis had a very good business mind, and while Maria oversaw most aspects of the governance of her realms herself, she delegated oversight of the Austrian treasury to Francis. Over the course of a quarter of a century, he transformed Austria from one of Europe's most indebted nations to one of its most financially sound states. Maria's own style of governance was reflective of the governance system espoused by absolute monarchs throughout Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. While such rulers in France, Austria, Russia and other absolute monarchies were effectively all-powerful and did not defer to any parliament or legislative assembly, they nevertheless left responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of government in the hands of a clique of ministers, who they appointed to run the country often with a very powerful chief minister overseeing affairs. At the Austrian court, these leading officials were known as the Geheimrat, Geheim meaning secret, and as such, the Geheimrat would be the closest political confidant of the monarch, similar to a secretary of state in England. During Maria's reign, the most powerful Geheimrat was Wenzel Anton, prince of Kaunitz-Riedberg. Kaunitz rose to prominence as Austrian ambassador to France, and became State Chancellor and Minister for Foreign Affairs in 1753, posts he would effectively monopolize for the next 40 years. Much of his foreign policy mirrored Maria's inclinations in seeing Prussia and its ruler Frederick II as Austria's foremost nemesis. He was the most powerful politician in 18th century Austria, though other councillors such as Matthias Franz, Graf von Cherinsky, Bishop of Brno, and his Cherinsky relatives also played important roles in the governance of Maria's realms. She was never far from affairs either, and while Kaunitz and others managed the day-to-day -day business of government, the Empress was consulted regularly and ultimately had to sanction all major domestic reforms and foreign policy decisions. Some of the foremost domestic issues facing Austria during Maria's reign concerned religion. The House of Habsburg were amongst the great champions of Roman Catholicism in Europe during the early modern period and had fought hard to prevent the rise of Protestantism in Austria itself with success. But Maria's forebears had inherited and conquered territories since the 16th century which had large religious minorities within them. In particular, Bohemia and Hungary were a patchwork of Catholics, 
Jews and various types of Protestants, including Lutherans, Hussites, Calvinists and Moravians. As a zealous Roman Catholic, Maria aimed to convert her Protestant subjects or at least create a religiously pure core to her territories. In line with this, she exiled thousands of Protestants who were living in Upper Austria to the remote Transylvania region in the eastern extremities of the Habsburg lands around what is now Western Romania. In tandem, workhouses were established in Hungary and Bohemia to forcibly inter Protestants in them and try to convert them to Catholicism. This was just the latest effort by a Habsburg monarch to convert the Protestants of these regions to Catholicism and like all her predecessors before her, Maria's policies failed. Major Protestant minorities remained a feature of both Hungary and Bohemia through to modern times. While Maria Theresa's approach towards her Protestant subjects was to attempt to forcibly convert them, she adopted an altogether different policy regarding the Jews of the Habsburg territories. Tens of thousands of Jews had settled in Austria, Bohemia and Hungary in the late medieval period following their expulsion from countries like England and France. There was a sizable Jewish population here as a result by the 18th century. Maria exhibited the anti-Semitic views which were typical of many zealous Catholics during the early modern period, and she actively persecuted them for much of her reign. For instance, in 1747, a toleration tax was issued, aimed primarily at the Jews of Hungary, where the greatest concentration of Jews in the Habsburg lands was to be found. This imposed a heavy tax on Jews in towns like Buda, with the threat of forced expulsion from the Habsburg lands if they did not pay this. Many poorer Jews were consequently forced to migrate eastwards to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which had a long history of toleration of the Jewish people. Others remained and paid the tax. It was lightened as the years went by, and Maria Theresa's anti-Semitic policies were loosened in general from the late 1750s onwards, as the Empress was influenced by the courtier Abraham Mendel Teben, the unofficial leader of the Jewish community in Hungary, who gained considerable influence at the court in Vienna at this time. In time, the toleration tax was removed altogether in the 1790s, and cities like Vienna and Budapest would retain their significant Jewish communities through to the 20th century. The War of the Austrian Succession was far from the only conflict which Austria became embroiled in during Maria's long reign. When that conflict ended, a general realignment of the European balance of power began. For decades, Austria and Britain had been allied with each other to check the growth of French power on the continent. But the War of the 1740s had convinced King George II's government in England that Austria was no longer capable of doing so militarily. Therefore, in the late 1740s and early 1750s, Britain had begun cultivating Prussia as a new continental ally. This, in turn, led to Austria drifting towards a French alliance with the ultimate goal of reacquiring Silesia in a new war with Prussia. Kaunitz was the architect of this new foreign policy, though Maria actively supported him. The end result of all this manoeuvring was the diplomatic revolution of 1756, the two prongs of which were a formal Anglo-Prussian alliance and a rival agreement reached between France and Austria that same year under the terms of the First Treaty of Versailles. This in turn pulled Austria and Prussia into a war which had been underway between Britain and France since 1754, primarily over their respective colonies in North America, where France still controlled the region around eastern Canada and the British colonies covered what is now the east coast of the United States. The entry of Maria Theresa's nation and others like Prussia into the conflict in 1756 commenced what is known as the Seven Years' War, which would last down to 1763. Thanks to our sponsor Curiosity Stream, the best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel, and so much more. Curiosity Stream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else. It is the place for true storytelling as they provide diverse content, telling true life stories without sensationalizing the topics. We've been watching Crash Course European History and can recommend the episode on Medieval Europe.
It's about the history of the Middle Ages, including the Black Death. Another great history documentary we found was The Masters of Trade from the Bronze Age series, telling of the beginnings of international trade and the associated creation of wealth and more advanced civilizations. It's an amazing story and so well told. You will also find lots of other amazing documentaries on subjects such as science, food, technology, travel, as well as nature. And you can stream on all your favorite streaming devices, on the web, on TV through Roku, Xbox, Smart TVs, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and more. Plus, it's one of the best streaming deals available. Go to curiositystream.com people or scan the QR code for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for our fans, use promo code PEOPLE and you will save 25%. So click the link below or go to curiositystream.com people and save 25% right now. As with the War of the Austrian Succession before it, the Seven Years' War was primarily fought between Britain and France, and on this occasion, the fighting extended to their colonies in North America, the West Indies, and even India, leading many historians to call this the First Global War. Austria's role in it was largely confined, once again, to Central Europe, where it vied with Prussia for control of parts of Germany. Frederick II had overrun the electorate of Saxony in northeastern Germany in the first weeks of the conflict in 1756, an action which angered many other European powers such as Sweden and Russia, as Prussia had not declared war on Saxony and these other northern and eastern European powers were worried about Prussia acquiring too much power in Central Europe too quickly. Yet Austria could not respond immediately given its inferior military. Accordingly, a second treaty was agreed with France in 1757, whereby the French government agreed to send troops to aid Austria against Prussia and provided 12 million florins in funding. It also provided for Austria, Sweden and Russia to divide Prussia's territory between them if they secured complete victory in the war. In return, Maria agreed to relinquish some of her territory in the Austrian Netherlands around modern-day Belgium to the House of Bourbon which ruled France and Spain. With this agreement in place, Austria went on the offensive with aid from Sweden and Russia against Prussia. Maria's armies won a significant victory over the Prussians at the Battle of Kolin in Bohemia in the summer of 1757, while further successes followed at the Battles of Hochkirch in Saxony in October 1758, of Kunersdorf in Brandenburg in August 1759, and of Landshut in the summer of 1760. With these, Maria's armies were able to launch raids against the Prussian capital of Berlin, and even briefly occupied the city. But diplomatic realignments in the early 1760s changed the face of the conflict in Central Europe again. In 1762, Russia agreed to the Treaty of St. Petersburg with Frederick II of Prussia following the accession of Tsar Peter III in Russia in the first weeks of 1762. Sweden made peace as well soon afterwards, with both powers agreeing to end the conflict without taking any territory from Prussia. This was a major diplomatic coup for Frederick, which left Austria alone to fight Prussia in Germany. In this changed situation, Frederick was able to launch a new offensive against Maria's armies, and soundly defeated the Austrians at the Battle of Berkersdorf in what is now southwestern Poland on the 21st of July 1762. The wider war between France and Britain was also drawing to an inexorable conclusion, and with defeat at Berkersdorf, the Austrian and Prussian governments entered into concerted peace negotiations. The Seven Years' War came to an end in 1763, Numerous treaties were agreed between the different powers. The Treaty of Paris was the main agreement between Britain and France and was effectively a victory for Britain, which secured control over New France, laying the foundations for British Canada. Britain also emerged as the predominant European colonial power in India. The main treaty which involved Maria Theresa and Austria was the Treaty of Hubertusburg. This was primarily with Prussia, but also involved a number of other German states, particularly Saxony. The terms of it were rather simple. It largely returned the borders of Prussia, Austria and Saxony 
to where they had been at the commencement of hostilities in 1756. It could therefore be viewed as a failure for Maria Theresa, as she and Kaunitz had brought Austria into the war with the goal of retaking Silesia from Prussia. However, in reality, Austria was the victor. At the start of the conflict, Prussia's army was so superior to Austria and Saxony's that it would have reasonably expected to acquire significant new territories at the expense of Saxony. Had it done so, it would have acquired a predominant position in Germany sooner than it did. But through shrewd diplomatic and military alliances with France, Sweden and Russia, and the victories which her armies won against Prussia between 1757 and 1760, Maria's government managed to curb Prussia's ambitions for the time being. At the end of the Seven Years' War, Maria and her councillors realised that there was little chance of recovering Silesia from Prussia, and that the wars which Austria had engaged in for 15 of the first 23 years of her reign had been largely fruitless. Consequently, she would focus primarily on domestic reform within the Habsburg lands for the remainder of her life. This was a period of pronounced change in the governments, societies and economies of Europe driven by the ideas of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a general intellectual movement of the 18th century, which followed from the scientific revolution of the 17th century. During it, writers like Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Locke, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Adam Smith, Thomas Paine, and Benjamin Franklin began questioning the values of their societies and governments in Britain, France, the British colonies in North America, and Prussia. The morality of established society was questioned, as were its political systems. While many called for a rational approach to economic progress and scientific investigation, in time the ideas of the Enlightenment would lead to the American and French revolutions, and major reform movements in countries like Britain. Austria did not have a major domestic enlightenment, and there are no Austrian writers and thinkers of the 18th century to rival Voltaire, Rousseau, or Paine. The religious and political environment of the Habsburg lands was simply too conservative and too wedded to Catholicism to welcome these ideas openly. However, the ideas emerging in France, Britain, and elsewhere nevertheless seeped into Austrian society and, as a consequence, Maria Theresa's reign is seen as marking a move towards enlightened despotism, whereby an absolute monarch initiated a considerable reform program despite the overt conservatism of the ruler and the society in question. One element of this enlightened despotism concerned reform of the internal workings of government in Vienna. Maria's natural inclinations when it came to the institutions of government were conservative, but she was aware that changes needed to occur to modernize Austria following the weakness of her father's reign. Therefore, she initiated a wide-ranging overhaul of her government's bureaucracy, one which was overseen by Friedrich Wilhelm von Haugwitz. By 1760, von Haugwitz had established a wide-ranging civil service, which employed over 10,000 officials across the empire. This streamlined the implementation of government directives and improved the government's ability to collect taxes and customs duties, where previously the more remote parts of the Habsburg dominions in parts of Croatia, Eastern Hungary and Transylvania had barely experienced any government oversight for generations, although she was hampered by a wide range of traditional privileges in Hungary and elsewhere, which exempted the nobles there from most taxes. The central administration was reformed in tandem, particularly the chancellery, while a council of states which acted as a cabinet of ministers advising Maria Theresa was in existence from 1760 onwards. Finally, the operation of the law courts and the judicial system was standardized through the compilation of the Codex Theresianus, a compendium of existing Austrian and Bohemian laws named after the Empress although Hungary continued to operate under its own distinct legal system. These institutional advances were supplemented by extensive economic reform. Much of this was spearheaded by Maria Theresa's husband Francis in the 1740s and 1750s, who, in association with the finance minister Franz Josef Toussaint, sought to foster the growth of joint stock companies in Austria 
which by the mid-18th century was lagging far behind the more advanced trading and commercial nations of Western Europe, notably Britain and the Dutch Republic. This, along with increased taxation revenues and greater savings and efficiencies in the running of the court and government, ensured that Austria went from a severely indebted nation when Maria Theresa succeeded her father in 1740 to one which was running a surplus 40 years later. This improved financial situation also allowed Maria's government to begin investing in improving and modernizing the Austrian military, a task which was also delegated to von Haugwitz. Under his leadership, a standing army of over 100,000 trained troops was created, but these still remained inferior to the average Prussian soldier. Further economic and social reforms followed in the 1770s. A census of the Habsburg realms at the start of the decade allowed Maria's ordinary subjects to express their grievances and many revealed the onerous burden of serfdom across the Habsburg territories, with many serfs, or as they were known in Bohemia, robota, a Czech word from which the word robot is derived, revealing that they worked seven days a week for poor wages, all while living in considerable poverty. Maria introduced further reforms as a result to break up the great estates of the Austrian and Bohemian nobles and distribute some of their lands amongst the peasantry. But her subjects would have to wait until the reign of her son before serfdom was officially abolished in the Habsburg territories. Another medieval legacy which was gradually eradicated from Austrian society in the course of Maria's reign was the widespread belief in witchcraft. Beginning in the 14th century, when the arrival of the bubonic plague to Europe had led to an increase in the belief that malevolent agents of the devil were living in communities all over the continent, the number of witch hunts had increased, particularly in Germany, Switzerland and adjoining countries. Tens of thousands of alleged witches, most of them women, were murdered as a result of this frenzied witch craze in the 16th and 17th centuries but as greater rationality entered society following the scientific revolution, the belief in witches and the willingness to prosecute people for alleged occult activity declined. Nevertheless, there were still instances of extreme violence. The prolonged Salzburg witch trials of the 1670s and 1680s had resulted in 139 people being executed for witchcraft in this particular Austrian city. While Maria was inclined to believe in the supernatural, she was nevertheless opposed to the use of torture to extract supposed confessions from alleged witches. When Magda Logomer, a herbalist from the town of Krzyzewci in the Habsburg Croatian territories, was accused of witchcraft in 1758 and subsequently tortured and condemned to death, Maria intervened personally to order that she be acquitted on the grounds that her confession had been extracted under duress. Logomer was consequently allowed to return home and the case set a major precedent in the prosecution of witches in the Habsburg dominions. Henceforth, rational arguments and evidence would have to be presented to gain a conviction and the use of torture to extract confessions was effectively prohibited. With this, the witch trials effectively came to an end while the use of torture was officially prohibited in the Habsburg dominions in 1776. While certain elements of Maria Theresa's reign were progressive in line with Enlightenment principles, other aspects of her domestic policies favoured overt social control in line with zealous Roman Catholicism. One notorious example of this was the establishment at Maria's express order of the Keuschheitskommission, or Chastity Commission, in 1752. This sought to suppress any form of sexual activity which was deemed to be at odds with Catholic teaching. Prostitution was curtailed in the major cities and sexual liberality was viewed askance at the court, despite the actions of the Empress's own husband. Indeed, this opposition to adultery was extended throughout the Habsburg dominions and fines and other penalties were imposed forthwith. Homosexuality was also widely condemned and prohibited, as were sexual relations between adherents of different religions. Harsh punishments were imposed on anyone found guilty of these offences, including public floggings, deportations, and even the death penalty for serious repeat offenders. 
To enforce these laws, a form of morality police was established, one which monitored libertarian social clubs in cities like Vienna. While many of Maria's domestic policies were of debatable success or wisdom, her approach towards improving education in Austria and the wider Habsburg dominions was truly enlightened. In 1746, she established the Theresianum in Vienna, an academy for training young Austrian men in the sciences, languages, and other subjects such as mathematics and history, as training for them to staff the growing professional bureaucracy which was emerging in Austria during her reign. But her major successes in this respect primarily came in the 1770s, after the census of 1770 to 1771 revealed the scale of illiteracy in Austria and further afield in Bohemia, Hungary and the other Balkan territories. In response to this, Maria ordered the creation of a universal system of primary education, whereby children from across her dominions would receive schooling between the ages of 6 and 12. Teacher training academies were established in tandem to provide more instructors. Yet Maria would not live to see the fruits of these endeavors, as it was the 1780s and 1790s before literacy levels in Austria and other parts of the Habsburg territories began to increase considerably. Nevertheless, if there was a policy area where Maria Theresa was truly an Enlightenment ruler, it was in the field of educational reform. The same might also be said of Maria's approach towards the medical revolution which was occurring across Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries as a corollary to the scientific revolution. In this case, her enlightened approach was informed by her own personal experiences and tragedies as smallpox was the most brutal disease of the 18th century. This virus is a much more hazardous cousin of chickenpox and cowpox. Smallpox generally incubates for two weeks, then leads to four or five days of initial symptoms, followed by a week and a half when the rash begins, then worsens and leads to pus-filled sores, and then finally a week and a half in which the fever breaks and the sufferer begins to either recover or else dies. Upwards of 20% of those who contracted the disease died from it, and in the 18th century, this resulted in nearly half a million deaths across Europe every year. While even for those who survived, many were often left with dreadful scarring on their skin once the disease abated, much of it on the victim's face. In the 1760s, Austria was hit by a particularly virulent wave of smallpox, one which killed three of Maria's children. She contracted the disease herself in 1767, and while it did not kill her, the devastation it caused for her family ensured that Maria became a prominent advocate of medical reforms thereafter. Back in 1745, Maria Theresa had employed the Dutchman Gerard von Swieten as the royal physician. Now, in the mid-1760s, she instructed him to begin gathering information on what the best practices were for combating smallpox. Trials had been underway for years in Britain and elsewhere, to develop what would eventually become known as a vaccine for the deadly disease, and although it would be some time before Edward Jenner successfully produced a smallpox vaccine, the basic principles for how to produce one were known by the 1760s. Von Swieten was skeptical that a method being trialed by Robert Sutton and his son David in England would prove effective, but it was successfully demonstrated to provide immunity to the disease to several dozen children in Austria, in the late 1760s. Consequently, like King George III and Queen Charlotte in Britain, Maria Theresa was an early patron of vaccination experiments. Other medical reforms which she pioneered included the establishment of a medical academy under von Swieten's directorship, the regulation of apothecaries, and other purveyors of drugs, and the prohibition of lead as a substance from which drinking vessels could be made, as knowledge concerning lead poisoning grew. The death of her three children was not the only fatality which struck Maria Theresa's family in the 1760s. On the 18th of August 1765, while returning in his carriage from the opera at Innsbruck, her husband, Francis, died suddenly. He was just 56 years of age, and his death may have been the result of a major heart attack. Despite his serial infidelity over the years, Maria Theresa was devastated by his passing. 
She remained in mourning attire for the rest of her life and had the walls of her apartments in the Hofburg Palace painted black. France's death also had extensive implications for the governance of the empire and the Habsburg territories. While Maria had been accepted as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire in the 1740s, it was always assumed that a man should be co-ruler with her. And so, when Francis died, Maria's eldest son and heir was effectively promoted to become co-ruler with her, acquiring the title of Holy Roman Emperor and the other titles attendant on the head of the House of Habsburg. Maria was still the more senior of the pair, but Joseph played an active role in the governance of the Habsburg dominions for the last decade and a half of her life. It would be a tempestuous co-rule, with Joseph frustrated by both his mother's overly conservative approach to domestic affairs and her seeming lack of ambition for Austria on the international stage. As all of these events were occurring in the 1760s, Maria was also managing the marital affairs of her many daughters. The sons and daughters of royal houses were bargaining chips in the early modern period, used to forge alliances with other states. Moreover, in the case of the House of Habsburg, judicious marriage alliances were what had allowed it to rise from a minor noble family with holdings in the Alps region to one of Europe's most powerful royal families. Consequently, Maria was determined to pursue an advantageous dynastic policy through her daughter's marriages. Maria Carolina, for example, was married in 1768 to Ferdinand IV, King of Naples and Sicily, while Maria Amalia was betrothed to the Duke of Parma. Both marriages were designed to restore Habsburg influence in some of the Italian territories, which it had relinquished control over following the War of the Austrian Succession. Another daughter, Maria Cristina, with whom Maria Theresa was particularly close, married Albert Casimir, Duke of Teschen, in 1766, though the marriage failed to produce children who lived into adulthood, and Cristina, like her father, was a serial adulterer. Easily the most significant marriage pawn in Maria Theresa's use of her daughters as part of her dynastic strategy was her youngest daughter. She was born as Maria Antonia in 1755, but the world knows her primarily by the name she would adopt later in her life, Marie Antoinette. In order to further cement the alliance which had been established between Austria and France back in 1756, Maria Theresa and King Louis XV of France agreed to marry two of their children in the 1760s. In 1768, when Maria Antonia was just 13, Mathieu Jacques de Vermond, a member of Louis XV's court, arrived to Vienna to begin tutoring Antonia in French and the culture of the French court at Versailles. By this time, it had been determined that she would marry the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin Louis Auguste, who was just a year older than her. They were finally wed in the early summer of 1770, when he was 15 and Antonia was 14. The marriage was initially problematic, and Louis is believed to have suffered from some sexual dysfunction. But in the years following his accession as King Louis XVI in 1774, they became closer and eventually had four children. But Marie Antoinette, as she became known, was always an unpopular figure in France, and she became a lightning rod for discontent with the monarchy there in the 1780s. Maria Theresa would die many years before her daughter, ultimately, ended up imprisoned by the revolutionary government of the country which Maria plotted to make her queen of. The latter part of Maria Theresa's reign was also significant in initiating one of the most profound political and territorial changes which would occur in Eastern Europe in the early modern period, one which would have implications down to the 20th century. For many years, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been the sick man of Europe. This vast state once covered a geographical area equivalent to modern-day Poland, much of western Ukraine and western Belarusia, and parts of the Baltic states like Lithuania and Latvia, as well as portions of Slovakia. However, after peaking in power in the 16th century, it had lost ground to its neighbours, Russia, Prussia and Austria, during the course of the 17th century, hamstrung by an overly powerful aristocracy and a backwards economic system. 
the War of the Polish Succession, a few years before Maria Theresa became Empress and head of the House of Habsburg, had demonstrated exactly how weak the Commonwealth was as the other European powers determined who would rule Poland. Between the 1770s and 1790s, the Commonwealth's three major neighbours, Austria, Russia and Prussia, would effectively divide up the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between them in a process known as the Partitions of Poland. The driving force behind the first partition of Poland, which occurred in 1772, was Frederick II of Prussia. His motive was a desire to have Russia concentrate on expanding its territorial empire in Poland rather than by acquiring more territory from the Ottoman Empire. Maria Theresa's government, despite its conflicts with Prussia over the years, was inclined to favour this approach. And so, in the late 1760s, the three powers began applying pressure on King Stanislaus II Augustus of Poland and the Polish Sejm, or Parliament, to allow them to take some of the Commonwealth lands from it. Some of the Polish religious and political establishment formed themselves into an opposition group known as the Bar Confederation and tried to resist this through armed opposition, but this had failed by 1772, and the first partition of Poland ensued. In this, Russia acquired extensive territory in what is now Belarus, including the city of Vitebsk. Prussia seized a smaller but more valuable chunk of land along what is now the border of northeastern Germany, one which consolidated its control of the important Baltic trading port of Danzig, while Maria Theresa's government obtained a stretch of land in southeastern Poland and western Ukraine, including the city of Lviv. This new territory was formed into the kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria. Austria would remain in control of these territories for a century and a half. Although Maria Theresa would not live to see it, the first partition of Poland was followed by a second partition in 1792 and a third in 1795 the latter of which brought the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to an end and left Austria, Prussia and Russia as the three hegemonic powers in Eastern Europe. After this, Austria controlled nearly half of Poland, including the cities of Lublin and Krakow. Poland was not the only area where Austria acquired new territory in the final decade of Maria Theresa's reign. While the Empress was determined to avoid involving Austria in another major pan-European war in the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, she was nevertheless concerned to expand Austrian influence in the Balkans. Russia had entered a new war with the Ottoman Empire in 1768, one which lasted for six years down to 1774. But unlike the war between the two states back in the 1730s, this new Russo-Turkish war ended in a major victory for Catherine the Great of Russia. Under the terms of the Treaty of Kutchut Kainarja, which was agreed in 1774, Russia was left in complete possession of the Crimean Peninsula, and also acquired territory in what is now the southern Ukraine and parts of Moldavia and northern Romania. The treaty made clear exactly how weak the Ottoman Empire was by the 1770s. Not to be outdone, Maria's government immediately began applying diplomatic pressure on the Sultan's regime in Constantinople to be granted the territory of Bukovina, a part of Moldavia, a scenario which the Sultan's government agreed to in 1775. This pointed towards the growing rivalry in the Balkans to replace the Ottomans as the dominant power there, a rivalry which would continue for the next century and a half. In the last years of her reign, Maria was pulled directly into a conflict in southern Germany, in large part owing to her son's machinations. Josef had set eyes on the electorate of Bavaria in the 1760s, where the current ruler Maximilian III of the House of Wittelsbach was the last of his line, and his marriage had proved childless. As such, when Josef married Maximilian's sister, Maria Josefa, in 1765, it was with the goal of potentially acquiring Bavaria someday. Now, in December 1777, Maximilian died, resulting in a succession dispute. Josef immediately sought to divide the electorate between the House of Habsburg and Charles Theodora, a cousin of Maximilian. However, another cousin of the electors, Charles Auguste, had an equally strong claim and wished to succeed Maximilian as ruler of all of Bavaria. 
War ensued, a conflict known as the War of the Bavarian Succession, in which Charles Auguste soon called upon the aid of Frederick II of Prussia, who invaded Bohemia. However, before the war could expand into a more destructive conflict, Catherine the Great of Russia intervened, sending Joseph a warning that if he did not drop his claims to Bavaria, she would send 50,000 troops to aid Prussia against him. Joseph promptly desisted, and in the ensuing Treaty of Teschen, received the territory of Infiertel in the border region between Austria and Bavaria. Hence, the war did end in some limited territorial gains for the House of Habsburg. Maria had largely allowed Joseph to act unhindered in his pursuit of Bavaria, despite having considerable reservations about the wisdom of his strategy. Indeed, there was a pattern here of the Empress allowing her son and heir to determine a large number of policy matters by the 1770s as her health failed. Maria had never fully recovered after her brush with smallpox years earlier, and her health deteriorated further thereafter. By the time of the War of the Bavarian Succession, she was suffering from chronic fatigue, insomnia, and chest issues which may have been partial bronchitis. She had also gained considerable weight, although it is unclear to what extent this was obesity or swelling owing to edema, a condition which causes chronic fluid retention. Given all of this, when she fell ill in late November 1780, many believed it was just the latest episode in her ongoing record of poor health. But in the days that followed, it became clear that she was nearing death. On the 28th of November, the last rites were administered, and the following day Maria Theresa, the only female ruler of the House of Habsburg in its 650-year history, died at 63 years of age. Following a considerable state funeral, she was interred in the imperial crypt in Vienna, next to her husband Francis. Upon her death, Maria Theresa's son, Joseph, finally became Holy Roman Emperor and ruler of Austria in his own right. Over the next ten years, he engaged in a wide-ranging program of reform which eclipsed his mother's own efforts, one which has led him to being viewed as a paragon of enlightened despotism. Through his and his mother's rule, Austria had emerged as one of the great European powers by the time the French Revolution broke out in 1789, as the French people reacted to a series of crises in France during the 1780s and made Marie Antoinette the subject of much of their anger. Austria would form a huge part of the Grand Alliance of the European powers which resisted France's expansion throughout the 1790s and under Napoleon in the 1800s. Yet it could not prevent Napoleon abolishing the Holy Roman Empire in 1806. Nevertheless, in advance of this decision, the ruler of Austria at that time, Francis II, Maria Theresa's grandson, had himself declared Emperor of Austria in 1804. In due course, Austria would emerge as one of the major victors of the Napoleonic Wars, and the Austrian Empire, which Maria Theresa had done much to lay the groundwork for in the 18th century, would control much of Italy for the first half of the 19th century, engaged in a race with Russia to replace the declining Ottoman Empire as the preeminent power in the Balkans and challenging Prussia as the nation which would unite Germany under its rule. Maria Theresa was the longest-serving monarch of the Habsburg lands during the 18th century, and her reign was accordingly a very significant one. It is difficult to know whether to assess her time as Empress, Archduchess and Queen as a success or not. On the one hand, there is no doubt that Austria lost its hegemonic status in Central Europe during her reign, and Prussia emerged as a great rival for power in Germany. But Maria can hardly be blamed for this development, the seeds of which were sown in the emergence of the Prussian military as the greatest fighting force in Europe in the early 18th century, and which was augmented by the accession of Frederick II, one of the most capable rulers anywhere in Europe in the early modern period. Maria's achievement was in slowing the rise of Prussia by forging a new alliance with France in the mid-1750s. Similarly, Maria's reign might be viewed as a failure for not implementing enough reforms in line with the ideas of the Enlightenment, but she was the ruler 
of a profoundly conservative country, one which she nevertheless began to reform, paving the way for greater successes during the reign of her son, Yosef. Moreover, Maria Theresa slowed the rise of Prussia and began reforming Austria despite the negative attitudes towards her which led to her being viewed as an illegitimate sovereign for much of her reign. In the end, her success was to stabilize Austria and leave it stronger when she died in 1780 than it had been when she first succeeded to the throne 40 years earlier, all of which was achieved in spite of the impediments placed in front of her. What do you think of Maria Theresa? Was she a strong-willed female ruler who was more than a match for the male monarchs of her time? Or should she be considered a calculating tyrant of the Habsburg Ancien Regime? Please let us know in the comment section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.